I'm Lori Shapiro. I'm the rabbi and founder of Open Temple. I think um, I know everyone here. Really, I don't know if I know you. So shalom, shalom. And uh, I'm coming to you tonight from here. I'll show you uh, Prescott, Arizona. Oh, we're on a horse farm. It's still the end of spring break for us. And we are Zooming home tomorrow to begin our quarantine because our children are going to get back to school um, a week from Monday for a full day, partially thanks to Dr. Cara Natterson, who's our guest speaker tonight. Um, tonight is uh, really for everyone who's present. I had spoken to Dr. Cara and also to Zach. As a rabbi, I was fielding a lot of calls from people about how we reopen, um, about the moral dilemmas that people felt like they were in as we move through this very um, confusing time of, is there still virus? Is there not virus? Do I vaccinate? Do I vaccinate my kids? Um, what's it gonna look like in September? What's it gonna look like this summer? Are we gonna send back to our rooms? All of these questions that are going on. And so we created a container as we do at Open Temple for when questions like this arise. And the one framing that I wanna give before I pass this on to Dr. Cara, and it's okay to say Dr. Cara, right? Instead of now, she said, great. Um, the one framing I really wanna to give to this, and Cara and I spoke with this, spoke about this beforehand, is how this is really, I, it's a time where America has been under crucible and we are really walking through an embodied experience of how we navigate our lives morally. And so much of what I hope we can bring as a community, as a spiritual community at Open Temple, we've been exploring concepts of Musar. We had a class called American Musar, where we looked at Ben Franklin's virtues and saw how uh, an early 19th century treatise of Hezbon HaNefesh, which was creating um, Musar as a, an accessible, um, a digestible uh, practice for people who are falling out of yeshiva, um, how, how Musar really was a moral compass for people as they began to emerge from the shtetl and live in emancipated Europe. Um, there was an idea of it being free to walk about the cabin at that time as a Jew. Well, I can't help but think of the correlative to today and how we were all in this kind of shtetl of our homes. Um, many of us living through spiritual community on Zoom, whether it was affinity groups or literal synagogues, and how now we're kind of being emancipated, or are we, to go into the world. And as we reemerge, which is why we call it the butterfly series, we're going from we're going from caterpillar to cocoon to chrysalis. How do we break free? And are we entirely free? And in what ways are we morally tied to one another? And in what ways to the decisions we make as individuals have a butterfly effect and impact one another? And so tonight, hello there, David. Hello there, um, Janie. So tonight we're going to explore really the moral implications of this time. Hello there, Anne, beautiful Anne, supporter of this series. Um, how, what are the moral implications of coming back to life? And how is it going to have lasting impact on really expressing the morality of our country for months, if not years to come? Hello, dear Tamar, beautiful friend, I see you. I love you. All right, and so with that, I'm introducing Dr. Cara Natterson and so much gratitude for her giving our time today um, and her expert advice. And she was a part of the task force of um, Ella helping open up some of the independent schools in Los Angeles, also uh, giving advisement to, I believe, LAUSD as well. But more than that, you're a fantastic pediatrician. You've written numerous books that I keep on my shelf and even relate to these days to see what the heck is going on with my kids, even though my husband's a physician. Um, and uh, also one of the founders of 10th Street Pediatric Group, is that correct? I think I just... I, I just kind of put together from your book jacket, um, your, your resume, but if there's anything more, please share it. And with that, I wanna just pass this over to you. Um, the one thing I want to remind everyone, if there are questions, um, please put it in the chat thread and we will be taking questions throughout. And the last thing I say is I like to begin with agreements. And so the agreements I like to remind people of is this is a loving spiritual community. The core values of Open Temple are creativity, love, and truth. And so let's um, allow truth to be guided through our love and through our creativity and to allow our words to really fashion and model the highest of our human potential. Stephen Saar, I see you. I, I love you. It's great to see that you're listening in tonight. All right, and with that, Dr. Cara, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I'm adding one more thing to my resume, which is that 
Joel, Lori's husband and I are cousins. And that is how uh, we all reconnected. And this has been really lovely um, for me to, to be invited here. I'm also in a, a kind of an empty room. So I'm gonna try to speak um, with as little echo as possible, but I apologize for that. Um, so what I thought I would do is, um, you know, I, I love to get a gauge of who's in the space and who's in the room, and we can use chat um, to do that. So if you would like, um, please feel free to put in the chat um, the um, ages of any young people who live in your home or are a close part of your life. Um, because my background is as a pediatrician, and I will speak a little bit tonight about COVID in general. I'll speak a little bit tonight about um, kids in particular. And then really what I'd like to do is open it up and make it a conversation and um, hear your questions, answer them as best as I can, and, um, and go from there. So this is great. And I'm looking at, as people are putting things in the chat, and um, it's wonderful. Um, so, um, Okay, let me start with a little bit of kind of leveling the playing field and making sure we're all in the same place in terms of where we are um, 13 months into the, the real meat of this pandemic. Um, I say the meat of it because um, I was actually traveling last February, February of 2020. I had just launched a book and I was in the beginning leg of my book tour and um, events were getting canceled as COVID cases were appearing at some of the schools where I was gonna speak. But that was February and we didn't really wrap our brains around what was happening in this country until um, March 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, um, depending upon where you were in the country and what was happening in your community. Um, in LA, it was really most people point to March 12th as the day where uh, within a matter of hours, every school shut and um, it became a, a very stark reality. Um, and I will say from a, from a personal perspective that um, I have not worked in the office in many years, I consult and I write, but my husband is hospital based, he's a cardiologist and um, all of us who um, either work in healthcare or um, live with or love people who work in healthcare, it was a very scary moment. Um, and um, it's sort of, it, it, it was truly a once in a lifetime for them um, that, uh, that was at, at that time, 13 months ago, um, was filled with a lot of fear and anxiety. Um, we, we then in Los Angeles, uh, we watched as our numbers stayed fairly low. At first, we were the most aggressive state in the country. Everything was shut very quickly. Everyone made fun of us. Then everyone hailed us for being so fantastic. And then, didn't matter, our numbers started to creep up. And around uh, May or June, late May, uh, so about 11 months ago, we were looking at possibly seeing up to 2,500 cases per day in Los Angeles, which was generally considered terrifying. Um, it was considered a uh, sort of beyond um, imaginable for many of, of those of us who were looking at the data and trying to understand it and digest it. And as a result of that, we ended up having um, many closures, schools had been closed for a while, but many other closures that were looking like they were gonna be long-term. To put it in perspective, 2,500 cases a day in May terrified us. In uh, January of this past year, we had a day where we had 29,000 cases recorded on one day. Um, and when you stop and think about it, what was the difference in our emotional experience between last May and this January by January, we had become immune to a lot of these numbers. They were scary, but the nationwide death rate of 3,000 people a day, oftentimes higher, had become a death rate that we were very used to. Um, we are at 555,000 deaths in this country. Um, my daughter and I were talking about it today. She's 17, my son is 15, and um, she and I were talking about flu season, and she uh, and we were talking about the vaccine and she was talking about being vaccinated for COVID on a regular basis. 
and what might that look like? And I was explaining to her that in a typical flu season, we have somewhere between 35 and 65,000 deaths a year. 65,000 deaths a year is a catastrophic flu season. The swine flu year was 65,000. We are at 555,000 deaths from COVID. So I, it's important that we just pull the lens back for a moment and let those numbers sink in because living through this day in, day out, we have, as, a, as individuals, as a community, we have lost um, sort of our, we've lost track a little bit of the reality of the gravity of the situation. And that's okay, it's human. One of the reasons that we've lost the, the gravity piece is that there are so many signs that we're doing better in terms of case numbers and death rates, especially locally, but even across the whole country that we're all desperate to get out and reconnect with people. We are human beings after all. And there is vaccine. And there isn't just vaccine. We are giving up to 4 million doses a day. That's the new goal. We've surpassed 3 million doses a day and we're heading towards four. That's incredible. Uh, I just read about an hour ago a headline that 20% of all Americans have received at least one shot. I mean, just think about it for a second. 13 months ago, we were locking ourselves into our homes, terrified, not knowing how this thing was transmitted. 13 months later, we have 20% of our population with one dose of vaccine at least. It's incredible. And um, again, little perspective, the fastest vaccination development process we had ever seen before that was for measles, mumps, rubella vaccine it was four years from start to finish. It was considered a complete miracle to be able to get it through the pipeline in four years. So we are looking at a vaccine that really was in pre-development with other viruses way before pandemic, but over the course of our pandemic went from ideation to testing, to approval, to administration in less than a year. And it's incredible. And, it, um, and I'm happy to take questions about vaccine and all the different vaccine options. Um, so a snapshot of where we are now. In LA, and I'm assuming most of you are LA based or have um, connections to LA um, because you're here. If you wanna talk about other places, we can as well. But in LA, we have seen a 95% reduction in case numbers on a day-over-day -day basis between our peak surge in January, late January and today, which is awesome. Oh, I see Florida's represented too. Okay, we can talk about Florida because it's an interesting contrast actually. So um, in LA, we're down by 95% um, in our daily case rate, which is amazing. Um, and we are aggressively vaccinating our community. There have been hiccups, uh, many of them, some of them a little bit more innocent than others, uh, but now we are doing a little bit better in terms of vaccine distribution. Um, I actually am a vaccinator. I work with Venice Family Clinic one day a week vaccinating, and it's an incredible experience. And I encourage any and all of you who have time to volunteer at vaccine sites, um, because it's really, it's one of the more incredible things that you will experience seeing people in your community come in. Um, so uh, we have hit orange tier. Uh, orange tier is a miracle for us. We were in what they call deep purple, um, not two months ago. And we have rapidly gone from deep purple to purple to red to orange. Feels like total and utter freedom. Most physicians don't like how fast we've gone, I'll be honest with you. Um, in fact, our numbers have gotten so much better so quickly that we qualified to be an orange for on all parameters, except it, it was too short a time between red and orange. And so they just delayed the announcement of orange because they wanted to wait at least three weeks, which was something that was somewhat arbitrary, but at least it put pause for a moment on orange. We are going to get to yellow, I believe, we will get to yellow uh, by mid to late April. And that basically means we're open. Um, and the governor has just announced the state of California is completely open as of June 15th, which I find an interesting statement because I mean, I don't even know what's gonna happen tomorrow. So it's an amazing thing that we can say June 15th. Um, for the Florida representation on the call, I just wanna mention Florida, um, it's very interesting. Um, there, for every restriction that was put in place 
in LA, it was not put in place in Florida. Um, it does not mean there wasn't personal responsibility taken by a lot of people who live in Florida, but um, on a governmental level, none of those safeguards were put in place. And what's sort of shocking is that the numbers in Florida are really no worse than the numbers anywhere else. And people are really trying to understand that. Um, and what, I, what I'm reading that feels the most compelling about Florida is that a number of people who go to Florida are then leaving and getting tested when they leave, or they are citizens of another state or, or um, even country, although that's a small number because we've had a lot of our borders closed, but, um, but they are citizens of other states and your number is recorded based upon the state in which you live, generally speaking, not based upon the state in which you are visiting. So um, if I go to Florida and I get a COVID test, my address is in California and um, there's a lot of confusion in the data there, but I'm probably gonna show up if I'm a positive COVID test in the California numbers and not in the Florida numbers. And for sure, I'm gonna show up in the California numbers if I've gone back to Florida, to California with the COVID I picked up in a more open community. So the Florida numbers are a bit deceiving. Um, that said, uh, you know, I think it, it does prove that the, the containment of pandemic is not entirely the responsibility of government. It, it happens, you know, how we, how we fight a pandemic is as much about the rules that we create for our community as it is about our individual behavior. Um, lots of people, and people I'm seeing it on the chat here, um, are very worried about the next surge. And so maybe I'll talk about that for a couple minutes. I'll talk about vaccines and vac vaccine passports, and then we can open it up to a conversation. Um, I'm worried about a surge as well. <laughs> Let me be really clear, uh, which is why I make the comment about June 15th feeling like a very arbitrary date um, and goal. Um, if you look at Michigan, my brother lives in Michigan, so Michigan's a really good example. It's also the most glaring example in the country right now. Um, Michigan's in the middle of a surge. Um, and if you look at why, uh, some of it has to do with restrictions being lifted, and a lot of it has to do with the circulation of different variants. It, the, let, me, let me see if I can summarize. If there's a scientist on the call, I apologize. Um, but I'm going to summarize in a very layperson way why variants shouldn't scare you, but absolute COVID numbers should be concerning. So viruses mutate. That's what they do. Um, that's called evolution. And, and it is their job to mutate, to try to outsmart our immune systems. And it is our immune system's job to try to uh, get in front of any shifts that viruses make. So the more people that are infected with coronavirus at any given time, the more people have multiplication of those coronaviruses inside their bodies, the more likely there is to be an error in the multiplication process, and that is a mutation. If you've got one person infected with coronavirus, the likelihood that their virus is going to multiply and make an error that actually makes the virus stronger is quite low. But if you have 100 people who are infected with 100 loads of virus multiplying, the risk of having a meaningful error that works in the virus's favor is higher. If there are 1,000 people, it's higher. When there are 10 million or 20 million or 30 million people infected with that virus, it's an absolute uh, known quantity that there will be mutations as viruses are replicated in different bodies. And some of those mutations will end up having an advantage for the virus and that will allow the mutation to spread. So that is exactly what has happened. We've identified now uh, several variants. The ones that you hear about the most are the UK variant, the South African variant, there are two Brazilian variants. There's the California strain, which is what happened to Los Angeles in January. There's now the New York strain. You're gonna hear about all these. It's not going to stop until we reach what we call herd immunity. And herd immunity means enough people in the community have antibodies against the coronaviruses that are circulating 
that we can protect the rest of the community from getting infected, we slow down that process of error making because there are fewer viruses that are multiplying. That's all herd immunity means. And there are only two ways to get it. You get infected and your own immune system starts making antibodies or you get a vaccine. So we must reach herd immunity in order for the variants to not matter anymore. And we have not reached herd immunity. There is no magic number that anyone knows of. Fauci has quoted a lot of different numbers. He started low so that people felt it was more attainable. I think that was an error. He says it was an error. He should have just been straight up from the beginning. Um, we, in, in science, we know that if we don't vaccinate between 90 and 95% of all kids against an infection, that infection comes back in the community. So herd immunity for coronavirus will probably land somewhere near 90%. Right now they're saying 80% is probably the number, but I think it'll creep up and we'll find that it's probably around 90%. So 90, 80 to 90% of all people in this country, in this world, we live in a global world, really do need to be either vaccinated or have antibodies that they developed because they were infected. Um, and the estimates now, uh, if we have 20% of all Americans who have a shot in their arm, but some number of them actually had COVID. And if we have, it, you know, most people think at least a third of all Americans have had COVID. Um, that's, that's the general feeling. Um, so if you take those two numbers, 30, 33% have had the infection, 20% have been vaccinated with at least one dose, we're getting somewhere near 50% because there's some crossover of people who have some immunity, but we're not at 80 or 90. And these other strains are circulating and they're circulating very, very quickly through many communities. And that's why we're all worried about the variants. So what can you do? Um, you can go get vaccinated. And um, if any of you are like me, when vaccines first came out, um, I spent 48 straight hours trying to get my mother an appointment. Um, and uh, everyone I know was trying the same thing. Uh, it, was, it was a very well thought out system. The people who got sickest with COVID should have been vaccinated first. So it was the right way to do it. Um, you know, the other way of thinking about it is everyone eventually needs to be vaccinated truly. So when you hear about people who got lucky and lucked into an early dose, or maybe they jumped the line, whether it feels ethical to you or not, at the end of the day, what I keep taking from it is everyone needs to be vaccinated. So let's just let that go a little bit. Let's not think, let's not harp on that. Hopefully, um, you know, we can just do this more and more efficiently and people will recognize the rationale to why it was done the way it was done at the beginning. But as of um, April 15th, next week, we are fully open to vaccinate every single person in Los Angeles County down to age 16. If you're 16 or 17, you can only get Pfizer right now because that's the only vaccine that's been studied fully down to 16. If you're 18 or older, you can get Pfizer, Moderna, or J&J. All three are studying, actively studying kids 12 to 15. I think that data will probably be out early June, I'm gonna guess, for the earliest data. And then I think you're gonna see emergency use authorizations stretch down to about age 12 sometime in July or August. Um, so I do think middle high and high schoolers will be vaccinated before school begins. Um, and then we just heard about studies of kids six months to 12 years for Pfizer and Moderna. Those studies are open now, and we're hoping that those studies end up getting completed by November-ish, and we hope data will be out by the end of the year. But if you've got some of you on here have younger kids, six, seven, eight, nine, um, your kids are not getting vaccinated before school starts in the fall. It's okay because it turns out that just like we needed to vaccinate the oldest populations first because they were the most vulnerable, the youngest are truly, truly the least vulnerable. They do not tend to get sick with COVID. Yes, there are horrible stories always everywhere, but the, the fraction of cases that are pediatric is minuscule. And as you go younger and younger and younger, the likelihood of being hospitalized with COVID or dying from COVID essentially goes to zero. 
Um, the most scary thing about young people getting infected with COVID is something called MISC-C, which is um, an inflammatory process that travels all over the body. And um, children have died from MISC-C, which is connected with COVID. Um, a total of um, 2,322, I think, children have had MISC-C. And uh, I don't know the absolute number of kids who have died, but it is in the double digits compared to um, a, an adult um, death toll uh, north of half a million. So I think when we put that in perspective, we can all exhale a little. Um, it's okay that our kids are not um, going to be vaccinated tomorrow. The last thing I'll say about that, and then I'll let's open it up to a conversation, is uh, if kids aren't vaccinated, how can we open schools? And the answer is that there is very good data. There's a woman named Emily Oster. She's an economist at Brown. Uh, she's also a mom and she, no one was collecting data. So she just started and she has data that um, starts back in September. And she has, I think uh, at this point, four or 5 million data points. She's looked at school systems across the country and she's the one who has documented people don't really get COVID in school. There are one-off cases, but schools are not super spreaders. And if you're wondering why, it's because schools follow rules. It's what happens in a school. So if your rule is to wear a mask and to keep distance, then you will not spread COVID to the person who's sitting next to you. And it has turned out to be so effective, especially when combined with testing, that the feeling in most governments, and I know in LA County, they have said this many times, um, is that even if we do have a resurgence, even if we do go back to red or purple, they will never close the schools again. They've learned their lesson. So um, with that, I think uh, I'll just open it up to questions and uh, maybe, you know, Laura, you tell me, but, um, why don't we just have people unmute if they have a question and ask away? Great. I would like to I, ask uh, a question. Great. Who is that? Who's speaking? Steven. It's Steven. Hey, forgive Steven my, Star. Hello, forgive Steven. my opacity, but um, I'm fine. sitting here in the dark. Um, I, I, it, Kara, I just, I have a dilemma. This is, a, a, as a parent, my daughter is coming of age. Uh, she's just of age, 18. She's eligible soon, I guess, for vaccines. And the questions that are really like deep in my mind and my heart and my parental protective impulse is, is that there is no research, and I've looked for it, on the impact on fertility. And, 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 and I'm looking at my kid who's looking at her own life, trying to sort through this. And we're not gonna have any of that information for a year at least, a couple of years maybe. And th this is like a, a swan dive into the unknown uh, for the sake of a, a rationale that while I'm vaccinated and I get it, I think about her and the potential unanswerable questions right now. And I have immense concern about it. I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Yeah. So. Let me walk you through why there have been claims about uh, possible fertility issues. And then, um, and, and let, me, let me start by, by leading with the headline. I have a 17 year old daughter who was vaccinated on Tuesday. So I want you to know where I'm going to end my answer, but it's just my opinion based upon my reading of the data. It doesn't have to be your answer. The concern about the vaccines are twofold. The first is there's a very large anti-vax movement in this country that has picked up a tremendous following. It first really emerged uh, around 1998 with the first claims against the MMR vaccine. And in this country, by the early 2000s, there was tremendous fear, so much so that vaccines were getting reformulated so that they were never mixed together. I was giving a measles vaccine separate from a mumps vaccine. There was no data that what I was doing was any safer than the combined vaccine, but we were so anxious about all of the noise that was being generated that, that the fear was clouding the science. And the science 
was very, very clear for that particular vaccine. Um, and, and as many of you may know, um, over the next 10 years, the guy who started all that controversy, a guy named Andrew Wakefield, went down in flames. He lost his license in both the UK and the US. He, his study that was supposed to be the study proving that the MMR caused autism was written with uh, 12 other co-authors, all of whom eventually uh, turned and said, we never should have written this paper. All the data was falsified. And the data, by the way, was collected at a five-year-old's birthday party. It's a very, very dark story. But I use it as the groundwork for this story because it's a very important to recognize that um, fear about putting a, a, a medicine or a vaccine, a substance into a healthy person's body is rational fear, okay? I fear it too as a parent. The concern about the COVID vaccine that has been brought up by anti-vaxxers is that, and I say that it's brought up by them because the groundswell has been an anti-vax groundswell. It's not a group of people generally who are, at first, who are looking to protect kids against COVID and protect themselves against COVID, and then they found some data and now they're concerned. This, if you look at the story of this fertility fear, it comes from this movement. And and here, here's the nugget of it. If you look at the DNA sequence that encodes for the spike, the, the antibody that's gonna to respond to the spike protein, which is what these vaccines are doing. The mRNA vaccines made by Pfizer and Moderna have a sequence of DNA. That sequence of DNA is meant to, or sorry, it's RNA. That sequence of RNA is meant to trick your body into thinking that you have a spike protein that is present on the coronavirus and therefore your body thinks you have coronavirus infection and it builds an immune response. When you look at that stretch of RNA, okay, there is a four uh, base repeat pair for the scientists on here. So it's four little segments, tiny little codon segments that can in theory, appear in the antibodies of anti-placental antibodies that do not allow women to maintain a placenta during pregnancy, okay? This code is very, very, very long. There are four, four tiny little um, letter segments in this one area that can appear in anti-placental antibody. There is no data, none, that if you get a Pfizer or a Moderna vaccine that you will make anti-placental antibody. There are pregnant women, many of them now, who have gotten COVID vaccine, who have not generated any anti-placental antibody. However, it's very scary to put something new into a body. And so this was what people went with. And when you say fertility and you say young people and it seems optional, the answer is I'm better off not putting it in my child's body. That's the, as a parent, that's your gut reaction. My only answer to this is explain to me scientifically, how if we are trying to trick the body into thinking that the spike protein from coronavirus is in us and these four little codons are in that code, how are those four little codons also not in coronavirus in the actual spike protein? In other words, if you're going to have an anti-placental antibody response to vaccine, you really should have the same anti-placental antibody response to COVID. And COVID, while it tends not to make children and teenagers sick, has tremendous now known long-term impact. Today, there was a study out, one third of all COVID survivors describe neurologic or psychiatric issues post COVID, one third. So I read that science, Stephen, and I let that go because I do not understand the claim about anti-placental antibodies and fertility 
stacked up against what I know COVID does in a body. And I didn't, I, I still cannot understand the claim that the vaccine does it, but the spike protein on the actual virus doesn't when the mRNA codes are essentially the same. And that is what allowed me to read the, the articles and then to put them aside for me. That was what helped me make my choice. Not only will there not be data on this for a year, frankly, there's not going to be fert real fertility data on you know sort of long-term outcomes of getting pregnant, staying pregnant, and having healthy babies probably for four or five years. So um, it's going to have to be one of those decisions you make where you just you you have to dig deep and go with what feels right to you, um, and and looking at relative risk. What is the risk of COVID infection versus the risk of an mRNA vaccine? So if I may ask you one more question, I don't want to, yeah. yeah, I don't want to take up some more time if other people have questions, but you have a 17 year old, she was vaccinated. Yes. Um, what reservations did you overcome to get to that? Well, really none. I'll be totally honest with you. None. I have read every I've never read more science in my life than this year. I've read literally every article that comes out every single day I read. And there wasn't a claim that I could find that stopped me in my tracks. mRNA vaccines have actually been studied for the past several years. They, they didn't work. That was the issue with them. Not that they had long-term complications. They simply didn't work against their intended targets. The fact that they work the way they work against this particular coronavirus is nothing short of a miracle. Um, but the there was never anything. In fact, my son turned 16 on June 8th. And you know what he's getting for his 16th birthday? Because he knows what he's getting for his 16th birthday. Let me tell you, it's called Pfizer. You know, as fast as I can get it in my kids, um, I, I am very afraid of this virus. I am not afraid of these vaccines. And that is based upon data. That is, and 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 I will I will add one other personal note. I have had a kid with a one in a million vaccine reaction. So my daughter, who got the vaccine, had one of those one in a million vaccine reactions when she was a baby. And I still did not hesitate when she got an appointment on Tuesday. We ran. Thank you for your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Cara, thank you so much for that. That was really, um, that was really vulnerable of you to share your personal story as well. And that's very open temple style. Um, I'm hearing a little feedback. Can you turn on me while I ask your question? Thanks. Um, so I, I'm just gonna speak from, from my personal experience. I, I believe I had COVID twice. I remember when I told Denise last March that I thought I had it in January. She's like, you can't be too sure. Um, but I do think, Denise, I have more data now. I, I have an immunologist friend at City of Hope. And one of his statements was, um, you'll know you had it twice if you don't repeat symptoms. That was a part of his insight. And indeed, I didn't lose my sense of smell the next time. I didn't have many of the symptoms. I had conjunctivitis, I had a UTI, I had so many weird symptoms the first time. I went to the doctor January 13th, 2020, and I said, do I have an autoimmune disease or do I have cancer? Because something dreadfully is wrong with me. And I had been in San Francisco the week before and everyone had a weird cough. Throughout San Francisco, I'd walk through the streets and everyone was coughing. There were, you know, it was, it was pretty endemic there. Anyway, I was sick. Um, I recovered, but I had weird symptoms for six months. I felt like I had mono. My head was fuzzy. I couldn't wake up. That persisted for six months. Then um, it kind of went away. And then on December 21st, I was exposed in a house that we're building. Everyone on our site came down with COVID and I was exposed just visiting a site for just two minutes. Um, and uh, that time, what I want to share, and this goes along with what you're saying, is um, it, it, it attacked my organs differently. And if I may share openly, um, it attacked my women's organs. 
And I'm a woman who, you know, in, in my cycle, I've never had an inconsistency ever. Um, I had two healthy pregnancies. I've never had any spotting in my life. And I had something very strange happen. I had a very strange blood clot, so frightening that I called my doctor and no one could give me an answer. Um, but I did get an answer from a Chinese doctor. He's a physician in China and he runs the Emperor's College here in, in Santa Monica, which is an acupunctural school. And he was the person, he's Natalie, um, our niece's uh, mentor. He was the person who got back to me and he said, you know, in China, they're studying that it attacks the hypothymus and impacts estrogen levels. So I'm, I'm curious about that data because I do want to kind of offer, I'm not a scientist, my husband is, and he's been on PubMD to see studies. And apparently there are studies about how it affects the hypothymus um, and how it affects estrogen levels. I don't know what the um, data is stating, but it appears that people are studying it. So that's all that I wanted to add to what you said to Stephen. And then I also wanna just share um, a symptom story, which is my husband who's had far more virulent after long hauler symptoms than I, because Joel has something called atrial fibrillation, which is, um, uh, for him, it came from an autoimmune disease that he's had all his life. And um, his heart has just kind of the, the wiring of it doesn't quite work right. That's my layperson's way of saying it. Um, so it ended up that he would have fainting spells. And then we put him on a strip and we found out um, that his heart had been stopping for six to 10 seconds at a time. And he was brought into an emergency pacemaker three weeks ago. And he, we scheduled, because after the pacemaker, you need a few weeks. So he's going to have an ablation where they, I say they like solder the heart. Is that what they're going to do, Cara? So he's going to have his heart soldered. Um, but, you know, like it's real. So the question, I guess what I wanted to illustrate is like, we're people who had COVID. And I don't know, I would have liked Joel to have been vaccinated, right? He wasn't getting qualified for it yet when we got sick. So um, he probably, I, I'll never know if, if, if his heart would not have been impacted. Things got really bad and he seems to think it was COVID that caused these heart problems. Um, so I'm just being radically authentic here and just saying, uh, I, don't, I don't know the answer. Everyone has to follow their own heart, but um, we definitely have sleepless nights these days, just wondering about his heart health and wondering, you know, we can't help but think this all started after he had COVID. So I just wanted to lend that forward as a cautionary tale and may my husband be okay after his ablation. We hear that they really work. So thank you for listening. I wanted to offer that up. And, and good luck with him. I hope that he does get better. Rabbi Lori, we're sending you lots of love and, and hugs to Joel. And, um, you know, I, I, what I've learned in the past year, because I was an early adopter of COVID, I did have it at the beginning of March last year. And, um, what I've learned is that it's it's a smart disease. It's like your smartphone. It's like, oh, you have you have fibromyalgia, bam, I'm gonna go right to your fibromyalgia and amplify it. Oh, you might have a heart condition that's undetected. Maybe Joel had something small that was undetected. Bam, I'm gonna go right for your heart. I mean, it, and it even attacks anxiety, right? Even if you don't have COVID, your anxieties increase. So it's very much like this smart, like an eye virus, a smart virus where, you know, we, my husband and I joke like, oh, if you have daddy issues, bam, I'm gonna amplify those daddy issues. <laughs> I'd like to see the paper on daddy issues in COVID. That would be an excellent one. That would be excellent. Um, no, I, you know, I agree with everything that that you guys have described. The way that I think of COVID is that um, it's just very good at egging on our immune system. And if you've ever had pneumonia before, you know that every time you get sick, you feel like it goes to your lungs, right? Or yeah, everyone has their sort of weak spot, that thing that where a, a problem recurs. Well, really all that is, is leftover inflammation. You just, you basically have a, an inflammatory bruise on that spot and your body takes time to heal. And it's exactly what COVID does. It exploits that spot because the inflammation is turned up tremendously when you get this disease. And that is what this um, illness misc c is in children. It is inflammation that is occurring in all the blood vessels throughout the body. And so we, we have a lot of confirmation that your description, Denise, is exactly, it's exactly right. I mean, that's what COVID does. 
Um, and, and like Lori said, people can get it twice. Um, and it, for those of you who are on the call who have had it, um, the next question is, should I get vaccinated anyways? And the answer is yes, please do, um, because the data looks very promising. If you have not had a vaccine yet post-COVID, uh, I just warn you, it's a doozy for those of you who had COVID. Um, everyone who complains that they feel rotten after a vaccine, they don't hold a candle to the people who have had COVID who get the vaccine. Um, guessing Vanessa, you've had your vaccine. Um, it's it rocks you. Yeah, um, I my whole uh, bubble had it. Um, my father is David Poster, who you see his forehead over there. Um, he's ninety four. Um, my husband is um, diabetic and asthmatic, and I do a lot of yoga. I'm very fit. Um, we all got it from the same person. We all had completely different symptoms. My father had no very bad symptoms, ended up in the hospital with pneumonia, got the remdesivir. Um, he's on oxygen every night, um, generally doing okay, but I'm convinced like, like Lori that um, whatever heart conditions he had before are a lot worse because of the COVID. Uh, my husband um, had the worst symptoms when we were sick. Um, but never had pneumonia, never was hospitalized. He had his first vaccine on Monday and he came home from work on Tuesday with a fever of 102, chills, body aches, the whole thing. He says he felt worse Tuesday and Wednesday and still a little bit today than he ever did when he had the COVID. I had a sore arm and a headache. My father had nothing. He's full, my father is fully vaccinated no symptoms, no, no problems at all. Not even any soreness, I think, in the side of the, I mean, he, he's just a, he's a trooper. Um, so my question is, since he had such a strong immune response, my husband to the first vaccine, is he gonna have a strong immune response to the second vaccine also? Um, Cause I know it's gonna be very hard to convince him to go back in and get it. <laughs> yeah, um, most of the reports are that it's the first dose of vaccine post COVID that are the hard, doses and usually because your immune system has been amped up three or four weeks earlier, depending upon which vaccine you got, um, you will not have sort of a third wave, if you will. Um, however, <laughs> never say never. And there are some people who post COVID, post vaccine dose one are saying, I'm out. And, you know, I don't want to encourage it, but it's probably fine because we know your immune system is already primed. And so we, when, when you have such a strong response post vaccine, what, what that's telling us is your immune system has memory. It sees the spike protein and it has memory. So, um, and I'm seeing in the chat, you know, um, it's, uh, it, 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 yes, get get J and J. Frankly, get J and J if you're worried if you that any side effect is going to keep you from going to get the second, only because it's one and done, and you don't have to get a second. Um, so my I, I do have some patients um, who have had very serious allergic reactions to vaccines in the past, and for people like that, what I'm saying is get J and J because even if you have a reaction, you you don't need to get another dose. Um, so it's. It, listen, we are we are figuring this out as we go along. There is no doubt that six months from now, 12 months from now, you are going to read stories that are scary as all get out about complications from vaccine, things are getting pinned on the vaccine. I, I know that's coming. Um, it's okay because we're going to be reading those stories about people who are going to be alive in a time when we are hopefully post pandemic. And I think we have to really remember that's the other side of the scale. On one side of the scale, yes, it's this fear of the unknown in these vaccines. On the other side of the scale is a very real consequence to COVID. And that very real consequence can be life-threatening for, for some, for many, so. Um, I, I, I think for it, wanted to say I'm something sorry, Vanessa, get, go ahead. But before we get too far from the um, in, infertility uh, fertility question, I am a um, DES daughter. I don't know if how many of you know what that is, but there was a, 
a chemical, I don't even remember what it stands for, DES, that they gave women in the 50s and early 60s to help make their pregnancy stronger. And they were wrong. <laughs> they, they, it was a strong hormonal thing and it affected the embryos. I personally was not able to conceive because of that. Um, and it was a horrible, painful life experience. I've gone through it. It was many years ago now. I've, I've done my work on it. Um, yes, it can be horrible to have um, those kinds of things happen to you. But when we look at COVID as a social thing and what's happening to this, everybody in our society, we have to accept the responsibility as individuals for the hundreds of thousands of people who have died and not continuing that. So personal tragedy versus social tragedy, making those decisions, making those personal decisions, it's, it's heart-wrenching. Um, I'm okay. This, my life experience has defined who I am. I, I do work based on who I am now because of the experiences I've had. So just wanted to share that. It's, you know, it's a really interesting um, example to bring up DES. It stands for dialthostilbestrol and it's worth reading about it if you don't know about it, because I think it does inform a lot of the, the fear around, you know, the anti-vaxxer movement, it's not a group of bad people. It's a group of people who are just really afraid and their fear is driving them to put forward all of this information that they're collecting in their silo because they feel that the information they have is is the more relevant data it doesn't make them bad it just it's 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 a little bit in its own vacuum and the des story is a very good example of one of the things that we've seen in medicine it was it was horrific what happened to women who were on DES? Um, my mom was on DES, and and you know it's no one knew uh, the consequences. It, you know people were really trying to help women get pregnant, and the the stories are really incredible. Um, and I think we will. I hope we don't see a story like this, but we will see stories out the back end of this. Um, but it goes to the framing that Lori gave in the beginning about the sort of the, the moment of social responsibility. I've always framed vaccines as a socially responsible choice. I, you know, when I was in my practice and parents would say that they didn't want to vaccinate, um, I, I would actually have them sign a piece of paper. And the piece of paper said two things. One thing is it said, I accept the risk of death, that I'm not protecting my child against a vaccine preventable illness. And the other thing it said was, I accept that I'm not taking my social responsibility to protect other people in my community. Um, I, I am a believer that there are exceptions to the rule. There are people who cannot be vaccinated. There are people who cannot take certain um, measures to protect other people. But that's why if the vast majority of us do, it allows for the people who cannot. Um, and I think that's what this moment is about. Um, I don't think that the anti-maskers are trying to harm people. I think they don't believe, they don't understand, and they don't know. Um, and the, the leaders in their communities, the leaders in their states are, are um, sort of filling them with all sorts of information that is leading them towards uh, a, a different answer. They, I really think if people understood that wearing a mask, keeping your distance, and getting vaccinated were the three things you could do to protect the people that you love and the people that you don't know. I really believe that the vast majority of people in this country would go, okay, it's not so hard. I just don't think it's been framed that way for them. Are there any other, I, I'm mindful of time. I know we're winding down. Are there any other questions that I can answer? Yeah, I am. Um, sorry. Tamar, please go ahead. So I want to ask the questions, a question about moving forward. I mean, suppose we live in an ideal world that, or an ideal America that people are really convinced that they should vaccinate and they do vaccinate. 
And then, you know, I'm comparing this to what's going on in Israel, that once you're vaccinated, you get like the green tag or it's like, it's our like COVID passport, right? But, you know, there are many parents in Israel that are asking questions. And I thought about this, that it's very relevant to hear. So suppose me and my husband are vaccinated, but the kids are not vaccinated. So we are not allowed as a family into the halls of the green tag, right? I mean, there is a, there is a contradiction here. And there is also the feeling that, great, we are free, but what about our kids? And how do we manage until the kids will be vaccinated and everything will be open for everybody? Um, so I want to hear yeah. your thoughts about this. So um, there are two issues with vaccine passports. And they're both about to come to a head. Um, they're starting to come to a head now. Um, so there are there are states across the country where governors have come out in the past two or three days saying that they will absolutely not ever allow a vaccine passport in their state. Um, and we have a country where federal government seems to have a lot of power, except for when the states have power. It's very complicated, the dynamic. But in COVID, the states have taken much of the power, initially because there was actually no guidance coming from the federal government. Um, and now what we're seeing is, I think, um, overflow from that where the governors were emboldened early on. And, and so they're able to make certain calls that the federal government cannot make because they, they frankly can't enforce the, the rules. So, um, so a vaccine passport here, um, at the state level means that the state government essentially mandates that people who are eligible get vaccinated, which essentially takes away the freedom of choice here, which is the, what we've been talking about is sort of people exercising their freedom of choice. And those, um, if you look at what states those are, those states also have other laws on their books that also tend to fall in line. So gun laws and, and other laws that are all framed around this freedom of choice. Uh, and, and it's a very hard argument to argue against because I, again, I'm just gonna go to, I think if people were educated and informed, they would make good choices. But these are often states that are not invested in educating and informing their citizens. These are not the states that have masking rules. These are not the states. and. And so that's, that's tricky in terms of the passports. The other layer that's tricky is the family layer. And you're exactly right. So um, there are all these pictures of places all over the world where people are getting into baseball stadiums and concerts and they show their vaccine passport and you go, well, what about my kids? So there are a couple of things. The first is, I mean, let's just call a spade a spade. It's really rotten that some people get to do things right now and other people don't. It's just unfair. Um, and it's particularly unfair for our kids. Um, it's particularly unfair for our kids in Los Angeles who have not gone to school in 13 months and yet their parents and their grandparents can go out to restaurants, but they have to stay at home. Like to me, I gotta tell you, I've been double vaccinated for a couple of months now. I'm not doing anything my kids can't do because it feels so wrong and disrespectful of them to say, you do your socially responsible thing, you're unvaccinated, you stay home, you distance, you, you do all this, but I'm gonna go out to dinner. I, I just, to me, but th this is at the heart of uh, American exceptionalism and American selfishness. And I really think we have a moment as a country, I don't wanna get, like, I don't wanna take over your job, Lori, but like, I feel really strongly about this, that we have a moment where we can go, oh, wait a second. It's not about me, 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 me. I'm going to look at the people around me and the people who live under my roof and I'm gonna be sensitive to what's happening for them and what their limits are. And it doesn't matter if I have a vaccine passport or not. If it's not okay for my kids because it's not safe because they could pick up the virus and transmit it to someone else knowingly or unknowingly, I'm not gonna do it. But we are, as a country, we're not there, right? As a country, we've just come out of a, a stage of me, me, me. And so I think if 
we begin to reframe the passport, not as your license to go to a concert when your kids can't or go to a restaurant or get on a plane, but instead as the first step towards showing that you're a member of this community and when everyone around you is protected, then you'll proceed. I think we'll do better. And I have been really surprised by the press coverage in Israel that I've been reading about this because I think of Israel as much less narcissistic than America, but I think some of what we're seeing there is that, and, and it's human. We all want to get out of our house. Someone had to go first. Someone has to go last. But I, I think we can see passports differently. And if we can, by the end of 2021, they will be very useful, but we've got to get there. So that's, I'm going to get off my high horse. <laughs> I, I think, again, I'm, I'm always very um, uh, respectful of time and your high horse is, is quite necessary for these times. Cara, we need to have courageous leadership through this time. Um, people who can both balance data and compassion and you really exemplify both. So thank you so much for bringing forward uh, a fierce, fierce, perspective. And I love the courage behind the words you speak. I think that we do live in a part of the world where people have been very fear-based. Some people where I live in Venice are very suspicion-based. And I think um, where I come from, my heart is I'm very love-based. And I think that you really balanced the, the primary ideas of people who were trying to get us to open up again in a loving way. And I think as a physician, it's really important to say that science has not only a voice, but a necessity through this time. Um, I want to balance it by also saying as a radical pluralist, I am always curious about how to be inclusive of people with different perspectives. And I'm hoping that the conversations can continue as we move forward as a nation together. And that when we meet people, who have really strong opinions that might be different than Dr. Kara's or than the ones that are lurking in our hearts, that we could be curious about the other and how they're navigating through these times. Because I think that that is perhaps the greatest test that we face in America today, which is how do we become a nation again when we are under such a trial? And I always go to these values that are my guiding light of saying, I'm going to be creative in the way I reach others. I'm going to be loving and I'm going to be truthful with myself and truthful with another with respect so that I can navigate my way through these times that are confusing, that are dark, that are challenging, that are filled with, filled with unknowns and fears. And so it's moments like this when small communities of practice come together and say, we're going to figure this out. Um, may we, this, this tonight's, um, tonight's uh, time with Dr. Clara has been recorded. So if anyone wants to share it, we can um, distribute it. Uh, Zach, our wonderful executive director, who's been so beautifully helping us organize these events, um, can email all of us the recording, if that's okay with everyone on the, the call. I know some personal things were, were, um, were shared, so pardon me for saying it um, at the end. And I also just want to give a blessing to this community and everyone that we touch, that we can move forward through this time knowing that it is a work in progress, knowing that we all just are caterpillars kind of inching our way through this transformative time, but there is great potential to what can be moved through these small efforts and small communities of practice like this coming together thoughtfully, reflectively can reverberate out and we can touch one another and say to our friends at schools like, hey, I learned that Pfizer is okay for 16 and 17 year olds, or hey, I heard that all three are being studied for kids over the age of, was it as young as six and seven, Dr. Cora? Down to six months now down to six months and it should be coming out in the next year, right? We're gonna have more data. Um, at the same time, we can say, what is with these passports and why aren't they including Rabbi Lori and Denise who are COVID survivors, right? So uh, I am curious about um, the fact that I have a blood serology test that prove my immunity and yet I will not be included in the passport. So I am confused by that, um, but that's part two. I don't know if we'll get it tonight. Um, and we do have a part two. Our part two is um, going to be, a a second part of this butterfly series, which is going to be with Hope Edelman, who's a grief specialist, because as we begin to come out 
um, of our time, we're going to through, go through this metamorphosis, this cocoon, where we have to face all the grief and the loss, not just of the 550,000 people who have gone, but, um, but really the grief of the lives that haven't been lived, the grief of the dreams that were given up, the grief of, of really what it means to re-enter the world that is forever changed. And so we're gonna hold a container of that. And then in a few months from then, Denise Berger is coming to us to share a very personal story about her flight after a time of, of tremendous distress. We drew parallels in our community while we were reflecting upon COVID to 9-11 and how America actually came together in a glorious way post 9-11. And Denise is a survivor of 9-11 and she's very generously going to be sharing her story and how she made her life a blessing on social responsibility and teaching leadership through the impact of her time of working at Ion Insurance um, on September 11th, um, 2001. So I'm so grateful for the arc of everything we're going to share over the next few months together. Um, let's continue to walk bravely through this time. Let's lead with love and let's find one another in the darkness. And thank you friends so much, Dr. Cara, thank you. You're exquisite, you inspire. <laughs>